Now, to get into your hat, Mr. McDowell. <laughs> I, wore it for, me, I wore it for a specific purpose. Let's go. You told me um, during, our, which God, during our conversations, well, I found out during our conversations that you always used to give me like little hints that you was, you know, you had, you had roots up here. You know, I just couldn't determine whether it was New York or like certain things. I'm like, hold on, hold on. Like he's talking about the four, like, all right. He must have been up here when he was young and probably, which car probably forgot some stuff, but he's been up here because he knows the four train, he knows the seven train and, 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 and stuff like that. He knows. But you told me, um, which car you had, you had, uh, which car you had family that, that grew up in Washington Heights in Manhattan and you have family, uh, from Patterson, New Jersey, home of, um, Victor Cruz. Stand up. Yes. Yes. You know, that's right. So, I say all that to say, with your with your tri-state roots, do you have any type of um? Do you feel conflicted, sports rise, because you already espoused uh, your 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 fandom for the Phoenix Suns of, of the NBA, but you also do pull for the Knicks. And you pull for the Giants in football. You know, um, you a- actually have more of a reason reason to do so than I do with my Golden State. Well, yes. Yeah, that, that that's something that's not going to change either. It's always going to be, well, okay. yes. Okay, so- okay. <laughs> I, I, I do love the pool party, T. I, I will give you a nod for that. I haven't seen you wear that one. Your your T game these days is is pretty impeccable, my man. Listen, I, 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 I'm not going to lie. I have a streak. Because I, I figured, I'm like, all right, all the times I've been on video, I never want to see myself repeated. And I have so many damn t-shirts that my wife would probably attest to that I could probably go about maybe about a good six months straight without repeating a T. But luckily, I don't out. record. I don't record six months straight. But yeah, I, I had to pull this one out. I was like, oh, which one? Is- yeah, pool party, baby. <laughs> but yeah, it's, going back into your, your tri-state roots. Um yeah, do you feel conflicted when it comes to your, your your fandom of teams? Yeah, not so much anymore. When I was younger, absolutely. So I'll, I'll break it down this way. Uh, you're, you're absolutely correct. So my father was actually born in Italy and spent his first few years of, of his childhood there. Uh, and then his, and then what would be my grandparents on his side ended up going to Italy. They're, they lived in New York, but they went to Italy and adopted my father and my father's brother. Okay. Bought them back to New York, and thus my my dad, you know, is is now uh, in the U.S. So he grew up in Washington Heights. My mother grew up in Patterson, New Jersey. She was uh, one of many. She has so many siblings. Uh, so I'm not an only child, but I definitely was able to witness what it's like to have several several siblings. And obviously, my my aunts and uncles are, are huge blessings. Uh, so when I was younger, absolutely feeling conflicted. There was one particular moment or series that highlights this it was the 2001 world series Mm. new york yankees arizona diamondbacks i bill i was definitely in elementary school so i i'm doing the math correctly i was about seven or eight so i was in maybe second or third grade and i'll never forget game seven here luis gonzalez Hits the the game winning. I, I think it was uh, well, it was a hit, right? As matter of fact, it was a single or double. It was a hit off Mariano Rivera, who's who's unhittable in this moment. But somehow Luis Gonzalez gets the hit, and I'll never forget. Both of my parents were crying at that outcome. They were in tears. They were so devastated that the Yankees lost. Oh wow! So yes, yes. So it wasn't. Oh my gosh, Arizona Diamondbacks like they won their first title. No, 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 no. Opposite. They were they were really upset by it. And I didn't really have a huge reaction at that time. I wasn't pulling one way or the other, but I saw how deep the love went for the Yankees in our household. So growing up, definitely, if anything, I definitely um, was more of a New York fan. So I was all about the Yankees. Like you said, the Giants, the Giants went to the Super Bowl, the Eli Manning team when I was in high school. So I had the T-shirt. It was all about it. Victor Cruz, as you mentioned, was around that time frame, give or take. Mr. Salsa himself, Salsa <laughs> Menenge. So all that to say, Knicks, Yankees, G-Men, 
1000%. But not too long after, really, as I was heading to college, so graduated high school and then heading to college, this was 2011. I started to embrace, wait, I can be proud of my New York roots and and love hearing the anecdotes from my mom and dad about the East Coast. But my lived experience is as a West Coast kid. I was born in New York City, but moved to Arizona not too long after. So all of my foundational adolescent memories all occurred in the desert. I have not been to a game in MSG. I have been to the Footprint Center on several occasions during my life, right? We can spend 30 minutes and drive past there right now. And same with State Farm Stadium and and Chase Field where the Diamondbacks play. I really just had this moment of, wait, it's really cool to root for the local team. And, And I am an Arizona kid. I can drive past these places. I have memories at these places. So I can still rock the the Knicks cap or be proud of my Derek Jeter tee. (laughs) <laughs> Derek Jeter was also a huge inspiration for me when I was younger. My parents got me all the Derek, all the Derek Jeter merch and literature one could have. So I, I can still do all that, but ultimately I, I started to become an Arizona sports fan big time. So I, I was way late in the game and rooting for them. Okay. But by the time I was 18, it really became all about the all about the Suns, number one, the D-backs, the Cardinals. I started to make that transition. So if you would ask me this, Mike let's say 10, 15 years ago, some, some some conflict there. I wasn't big on the Steve Nash Suns teams when it was happening. Ironically, my parents and I went to a Suns versus Lakers game here. And I had the audacity to root for the black Mamba and his crew. (laughs) So I I will be forthright. I was not, I was way late to the party. Now I have the Steve Nash memorabilia and what have you, but it took me a while to really embrace. Okay proud of where my parents are from, proud of where I was born, but I don't, I don't identify as a New Yorker. I just don't have the authentic experience of having grown up there, but I am an Arizona kid. I love my state so much. I want to stay here forever if I can, because it's, it's home for me. Now, this kind of is going to segue into a conversation I I wanted to have. Um, It's a good thing that I did take like a little break and I can't decided to come back the time I decided to come back. I just like right after the trade deadline and your Phoenix Suns, because, you know, whether y'all believe it or not, this actually is a sports podcast for the most part. But regardless, which guy I'm going to do what I feel like doing. Um, your Phoenix Suns acquired Kevin Durant during during the trade deadline. Now, there's a lot of scuttlebutt. Matter of fact, not even scuttlebutt. There's a lot of people saying that Phoenix pretty much should be the favorite to come out of the Western Conference just based on pure talent. You have KD added to Devin Booker added to the quote unquote brilliance of Chris Paul. I am not a Chris Paul fan. I'm really not. I just, I've, I've, not, I haven't liked I've last time I liked him is when he was when, um when he first came into the league with New Orleans. That's when I was a Chris Paul fan. From the time he got traded from New Orleans to the Clippers to the Rockets, and that's kind of really where my hatred began. Matter of fact, no, my hatred really began and became ingrained when he was at the Rockets because I'm a Golden State Warriors fan. So that's an automatic Lob, rivalry. Lobs. Lob City versus Golden State. Yeah, yeah. And so Houston versus Golden State. I get it. I get it. You know, so plus I just, I mean, like I, I respect this game, but it was so, it was, <laughs> I loved, I loved when they got to the finals two years ago against the Bucks and it was up to zip, to zip. And everybody was just going on this campaign of Chris Paul's going to finally win his first ring and they end up losing four. Percent. How dare you? How dare you? How dare you? Listen, I, <laughs> listen, listen. The book we thought we thought the door was closing, but as you are alluding to, the door is wide open once again for Chris Paul to to finish to rewrite and to finish the story. Now, with all like I said, with all that being said, do you believe that this is their best opportunity to win the championship? 
this season? Or are you prepared to say, you know what? 20 games to mesh. KD is still coming off an injury. They lost a lot of their depth, their defensive depth in the trade because they traded Mikael Bridges. You traded Cam Johnson. We love both those guys here. Yep. So do you believe that this is their best opportunity this on current season, or are you willing to put all your chips in the middle for next season? Yeah. It's, it's a great question. It's an important one. My initial instinct is to say next season for the reasons you laid out. KD, while this being the biggest trade of my lifetime as a Suns fan, while that can be true, the man is injured. Right, His health is a huge question mark. And not to mention, you brought up Chris Paul, you brought up Devin Booker. Those guys have also had recent injury battles. Uh, Chris Paul is more, you know, he's just been in the league and has a lot of mileage on him. The body breaks down sometimes. Devin Booker battled a groin injury earlier this season. So while I would lean towards saying put the chips in the middle and, and next season is really that golden opportunity, I'm going to ride with the here and now. I think I think it's it's the correct answer. Part of the motivation to make this trade, in my humble estimation, is not only because of the new owner, Matt Ishbia, wanted to, to make a big splash, but it was clear that this iteration of the Suns team, the, the Valley, the team that got to the 21 finals, but ran into the best player in the world who who ascended to another level before our very eyes. As much as we love that iteration, as much as it was built on homegrown stars, it was clear that they were not going to contend for a ring this season. That I think the vibe amongst the fan base here was this is probably this team is going to the first round and getting bounced. Best case scenario, maybe the second round and getting bounced. They've been really hot and cold throughout the year before the KD trade. When Devin Booker went out, it was clear this team's gritty. But offensively, what are we going to do? So making the Kevin Durant trade is a here and now move. It, it reopens the title window for at least the next two seasons. Hopefully longer. You kept Book. Book is the most beloved athlete in the state of Arizona. Brittany Griner, a close second, and Diana Taurasi. But Book is now number one. Oh, Mike, I can't even tell you. I can't even tell you how many kids are wearing the jersey, how many adults. Like it's the classic case where women think he's the most handsome man in the state, and all the dudes want to be like him. And all the kids are wearing your jersey at the high school. Like I've I've watched this since Book has become that guy. All of that being considered, I think I think it's it's wide open this season. I would say this is the time this postseason because the West is wide open. Yes, Denver's been very impressive and, and probably have this soon-to-be three-time MVP. But I don't know, and maybe this is a little disrespectful to, to Mile High Country, but I don't know that anyone is scared of the Denver Nuggets. No. no. So 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 the, the top team, folks feel like you can knock them off in a playoff series. The Grizzlies, you yeah. and I share some animus about the Grizzlies. They they were they were cute. We were all Maybe not all of us, but a lot of us were rooting for them because they're on the come up. They got John Moran, who's the most electric player in the game. But now they're starting to smell themselves a little bit too much, and they're, they're, they're total heels now. So I don't think anyone's taking the Grizzlies as a serious title contender. Maybe we'll be proven wrong, but that's what it is now. The Clippers, and again, I know I'm preaching to the choir here. The Clippers, are they legit? Are they fraudulent? They signed Russell Westbrook. What's going on? We don't know. Your beloved Golden State Warriors are the ninth seed as we record this. Now, while you know Steph Curry is one of my favorite players in the game, they're they're looking very vulnerable right now. They had an amazing title run last year. Yeah. They may not even be in the top eight to head into the playoffs. Do I want to face them in the first round if healthy? No, you do not. No, I do not but they are vulnerable. So to me, you get KD healthy. The amount of games left is not ideal, but if there is any superstar that is, is malleable and can fit into any situation, as you know, good and well, 
KD has proven he is that superstar where you don't need to adjust plans in a major way. He just fits. Yeah. I think the type of squad they have with Monty Williams at the helm is ideal for his game. So I'm all in for this postseason. I think the West is is pretty wide open. The East, Boston, Milwaukee, those squads are, are nice. They're going to be tough. But I'm all in for this postseason. I don't know if it's going to click in time, but I think they're going to try. I think they're going to make a run at this. And I think they have as good of a shot as anyone if if all parts are healthy. Now, I have one question when um, concerning your, 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 your Phoenix Suns. I'm ready. Um, you've, you've, met, you've mentioned Chris Paul. You've mentioned Devin Booker getting to that next echelon. Uh, you've mentioned the fact that KD can just pretty much seamlessly fit in. And you've mentioned the coaching of Monty Williams, who I respect, especially since he's an original New York Nick. Like, I, 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 he wasn't the best player. On the New York Knicks at that time, just be, just because he was a just journeyman, a, yeah, uh, yeah, he was a journeyman. But I, I really respect him as a coach of what he's done in Phoenix, what he did in New Orleans. He got a he got a raw deal back then. Like I, I really respect his his coaching acumen. But there is one wild card, one car, one person that you neglected to speak about, who's actually, matter of fact, literally in the center of your team, DeAndre Ayton. He's been borderline uh, a malcontent for the last year and change. Do you really feel that, yeah, of course, on the outside looking in, yeah, why would you not want KD? That's just going to expand your window because, like you said, they wasn't going anywhere this year. But do you think, how do you think DeAndre Ayton is going to feel with, he's, let's say, guaranteed, let's say, 10 to 15 shots a game, and now, He's pretty much going to be struggling to get about eight shots a game and being expected to do all the dirty work because they, y'all no longer have the defensive anchors of Bridges and Johnson to kind of uh, help him in the in the backcourt. Well, I'm going to manifest this. I I believe in Da probably more than most. So he actually is a University of Arizona Wildcat. So I was of the belief that you draft him number one, even ahead of Luca, ahead of Trey Young. Of course, if we could go back in time, I think Luca is playing in the Valley. You just, you figure out how to make it work with him and Devin Booker. It doesn't matter. You you figure out how to make it work. Luca, I've really come around on Luca in that regard. I mean, he's, he, he's just so special. I can't deny it anymore. But I am higher on most than DA because of that, because of where he went to school and, and my love for watching him in, a, in an Arizona uniform. He, you're right. It's been very curious. He, I remember when he had that, that positive drug test, right. For reportedly PEDs and yeah. served a suspension. I think this was maybe his second or third year in the league. And that was kind of curious, like, Ooh, what's going on here. Let, let's see what happens. And then if we factor in last season and how the, the relationship was clearly fractured, between him and Monty Williams. Uh, Monty Williams not playing him for a lot of that Dallas game where Lucas snatched the souls out of everyone in Footprint Center and myself included watching from home. And then him and then Monty Williams and DeAndre Aiden have their spat. I didn't think we were going to see DeAndre Aiden in his son's uniform ever again. So I'm just still, it's still jarring to me that he's on the team, that he started the year with the team and that the Suns kind of begrudgingly ended up resigning him. But I'm going to believe in D.A., his talent, if you're telling me D.A. is going to be the third or even the fourth option on most nights, yes, right? Fourth option, I think you got a heck of a squad. And, and to your point, you're not saying you're not saying how good is that to be a fan of a team that has D.A., former number one pick as a fourth option. Your question is, will he be okay with that going from 15 touches to eight touches? Yeah. I sure hope so, Mike. I don't <laughs> I don't have an answer one way or the other. I sure hope so. I'm going to believe in DA. The fact that you were able to keep him, and I don't know if Brooklyn wanted him, but the fact that you were able to keep him in this trade, in my estimation, is a great sign. It's your former number one pick. The guy is not a bum, right? No. I think his career averages are maybe 17 and, and 8 or 17 and 9. The dude can play. I hope he embraces this new role. I hope him and, and Coach Williams have rectified whatever's been going on there. I think the fan base 
has been willing to to accept him once again because it's been a little it's been a little iffy here. People talk kind of crazy about him sometimes. I think this is hopefully not only a restart for Kevin Durant, but a restart for DeAndre Aiden. I hope he embraces the role. I think he could thrive here. And to your point, we can talk about KD, Book, and CP, but I believe DA is going to be the key to whether this team finally gets that championship ring or not. Yeah, because um, I, I look at this, and I it kind of goes back to something that Shaquille O'Neal has always hopped on when it comes to big men. He's always said, like, I, I remember he used to use this point when it came to – um. DeMarcus Cousins, like DeMarcus Cousins should be averaging 28 and, uh, 28 and 10 a night. He was like, look at which guy that's seven points a quarter. You mean if you're supposed to be that dominant of a big man, you can't get seven points a quarter. You can't get three baskets in a fi- in a free throw a quarter. And I'm, and I, and I used to think like, oh, that's kind of, he makes it so simple, but literally like if you're supposed to be that man, supposed to be that dude, that should not, that should not be, you know, unattainable you know now in this current iteration of the suns it would behoove him to uh take advantage of every touch that he's able to get but i feel like going forward if they decide to keep him in the mix going forward with him kd and booker because you really do need to de-emphasize uh the importance of cp3 because he's getting up old you know he's getting up there in years that he's going to become that third option, but it's proven like Shaq and Kobe. It's proven you can have a dominant person down low and you can have two wing players and they should be able to coexist if you have the proper coach and you have the proper point guard. And that's where I believe Monty Williams, they're going to have, if they haven't mended their, mended those, um, those, those um, bridges, they really do need to get on the same accord going forward if you're going to keep him a part of this franchise. And um, like I said, I, I feel like, like, yeah, of course I'm biased because you're y'all, y'all on the same conference as me, or, you know, as the, as the Warriors. So, <laughs> but um, I feel like their best opportunity would probably be next season. You know, they're going to be a tough out because everything is so jumbled in the West. I mean, the Sacramento Kings are the third seed. Yeah, they're not to be messed with. They're, they're... Uh, yeah, and they're legit. Like Mike Brown. It's always coach, been a damn good coach. Coach of the year, Mike Brown. Not Hopefully, yet. future coach of the year. He should be. I think he you deserves know. it. Like, um, and I feel like that was probably the perfect team for him to try to mold because mm-hmm. they're still young and impressionable. You have you have veteran parts, but they're not overly the veteran parts in that team had not attained the success as much as the Warriors had. So there was always like a little whenever he took over for Kerr, you can kind of see the dip because it was almost like yeah we respect mike brown but we've done this we've done this without him we've done mm-hmm. it with him like sure yeah look luke, luke waltz had even stepped back in right back in the day and did well when kerr was out yeah i mean and one thing one also thing, a former sacramento kings coach ironically yes yeah that's all i was gonna say <laughs> one thing that was probably his detriment was he got two jaws based on that based on that historic start Mm-hmm. In, in uh, Golden State, when Kerr was out, he got fired from the Lakers job, and he did not do anything good with Sacramento. No, that's some off the court business I, that wasn't good. Yeah, like I, I would be shocked if he ever gets it. Well, you know what? Being the fact that his last name is Walton, he will get another shot yeah, eventually. <laughs> yeah, because it's and, another Arizona guy, by the way, Luke Walton, also. You know, fact, I'm, I'm seeing I'm seeing a thread here. Are you um I years ago, I think 97 when y'all won the national championship, the team with Mike Bibby, yes, and um Simon. Yes, Miles Simon. Uh yes, and and, and Lou Olson, like That's y'all, right. that Lou. team, yes, that team like was always sneaky in the play in, in the which going in the in the in the tournament. It was constant, constant. Arizona was going to make the Sweet 16 and occasionally the Elite Eight. Michigan was always going to make the Sweet 16. Um, 
Temple and and, and Don Chaney was always going to get that rugged, t- tough bunch. I've from been Philly. to Temple actually. Yeah, Don Chaney. That's right. It's you know, he was always going to get to the Sweet Sixteen. Right, right. And like, but yeah, Lou Olson to me, and it's probably it's probably not a mirror image, but Lou Olson to me was to Arizona what Lou Conaseca was to St. John's here in New York. Like he was always that fixture. It was always, yeah, as long as you had Lou, you knew you had a chance to get into the, to, into the tournament. He might he, not win it, but you're going to yeah. get in there. No. And having, and then I'll say, I looked this up. Uh, DA's career averages are 19 and 10 per game. So I, people talk reckless about him and sometimes it's justified, but career averages of 19 and 10, like we're not talking, uh, we're not, we're not, I think I'll appreciate this. We're not talking Anthony Bennett, formerly of UNLV and then drafted by the Cavs number one. Mm. We're not, dare I say, we're not talking about Kwame Brown mm. as Steven. But that's how people, <laughs> that's how people talk about DA though. They come for him like he's Anthony Bennett or Kwame Brown, early, early Kwame Brown. He rectified himself, <laughs> he rectified himself near the end. But folks talk about DA like, and, and again, some of the gripes are, are definitely uh, justified. Like DA, if you're near the hoop, you got to slam that thing down. No, none of this layup business. Uh, but 19 and 10, man, I think he's the key. Uh, having lived in Tucson, Arizona, the city where the University of Arizona is located for 10 years, if you include college to through adulthood, okay. um, I can tell you Lou Olson is um, just an absolutely beloved figure there. He is... He is number one in people's hearts, even though he's years removed from coaching that 97 squad and, and, you know, the squad 2001 and those, those memorable squads, he is the uh, just 100% approval rating in that city. You know, that, that, that just, that brings me, I don't even know how I'm going to transition to this, (laughs) but I'm going to make a way. I'm ready for it. Um, you mentioned at the very, 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 very top of our discussion when uh, you was talking about your time at Marana High School with Mr. Mr. Winchester. And that became kind of the genesis of what now is the flagship of 19 Media when it comes to wrestling and all other things, culture, gimmick infringement. Uh, so what actually, I'm going to kind of specify this for you. What made you get into podcasting? Um, and at the same time, you know, during your explanation, um, what would you believe would be the origins of Kimmy Confrenchment? Well, I love the little updates we have at the bottom for these, these headlines, these captions, headlines, (laughs) uh, Love, love, love everything going on here. Uh, first, thank you for that very generous lead into GI. I was, I was gonna say, I'm gonna let you cook. Just keep going with the flagship. The that that that's that's incredibly kind of you. So, in terms of the genesis of the podcast of of gimmick infringement, it wasn't immediate. So, I met Brad my first year. He had been in the department for several years. Obviously, he's kind of an institution there for good reason. And I started there, and we weren't like instant besties for for lack of a better term we definitely did not beef by any means but i was a newbie he was doing his thing and yeah we saw each other at weekly meetings but he wasn't coming to my room i wasn't coming to his every day um he wasn't even watching wrestling that closely back then and i was trying to keep up with it but i was also trying to figure out how to become a somewhat effective teacher so it wasn't until i want to say actually really the pandemic is when brad told me that he was just dabbling back into wrestling. So I think he saw some of my wrestling shirts on casual Fridays and, and uh, I ended up introducing him to AEW. And eventually, again, when the pandemic started, uh, unfortunately the pandemic happened. Right. Um, But for him, it was a time to reconnect with wrestling because like many of us, he was stuck at home and he ended up signing for the WWE network. And it was specifically that pirate Buccaneer WrestleMania WrestleMania mm. 2020 from the Performance Center. Okay. When he first officially dabbled into let me watch something live. Prior to that, he was invested in the Attitude Era. Okay. And then he took a major break from it. So he he knew my love for wrestling, which I openly shared with folks who, who cared to listen. He ended up watching that WrestleMania because there were no live sports on at the time. April 2020. 
And then from there, he was hooked. So I know that Bray Wyatt really captured his attention. He, he started buying Firefly Funhouse merch like, like no one's business. He he really uh, was really digging Bray back then. I just really enjoyed reconnecting with this, this entertainment that he enjoyed, you know, a decade plus ago. So that was the first seed that was planted as we started texting about wrestling and sharing tweets and 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 videos and and what have you. So that's 2020. Fast forward to 2021, he texted me. And by this point, I actually had moved back to the Phoenix area. So I went to school in Tucson. I spent five years teaching at Miranda High School, which is the town just northwest of Tucson. But I lived I lived in Tucson but worked in Miranda. Um Spent five years there, and then I moved back to the Phoenix area, Glendale specifically, in summer 2021. And I think it was that summer, actually, I got a text from Brad one day, and it said, hey, uh, Jess's colleague, Jess is his wonderful wife, he said, Jess's colleague is uh, starting a media company, and they're looking for talent, they're looking for hosts and ideas. Do do you want to start a wrestling podcast? And at first I had to check the message. I thought maybe someone, it was like a wrong number hitting me up. <laughs> I was like, we, we never, we never talked about this. I, I do have a journalism background, but we had never spoken about this idea at all. We'd just been texting oh, wow. each other. We'd just been texting each other frequently. And, and it was one of those things, Mike, I know you can relate to this, where at some point you realize a colleague is more than a colleague and becomes a genuine friend. You go yeah. from, okay, we exchange numbers and maybe we're texting once a week to him and I ended up texting or tweeting or what have you kind of once it multiple times a day, largely based on wrestling. So the tea leaves were there, but he sent me the official text message about his wife's colleague being part of this 19 media group. And I forget my exact words, but I said, yes, I'm all in. I love podcasts. I love you. Let's, let's try our hand at this. So we were workshopping names back and forth. Some of our ideas were, okay, what's a show? What's a what's a, a title for, for this podcast? So we thought of two marks and a mic. We thought of <laughs> so many other just terrible, not good names for it. Should they McFreeze? Exactly. <laughs> and and, and, and some, some of the decent ones were taken, right? That's the thing is that it's true that everyone and their mother seems to have a podcast these days. It's a very oversaturated market in, in nearly every subject. So when we had a name, we had to double check Apple Podcasts and Spotify to see if it was already claimed. So we ended up settling on gimmick infringement. Obviously, the abbrevi- abbreviation, abbreviation being GI. And what I love about what we do now is it definitely started as a wrestling podcast. And in many ways, I think you can still identify it as a wrestling podcast. That, that's the heart of what we do. But now that we're into, you know, year two and now heading into close to year three of, of GI. Wow. We've yeah. really, yeah, October 2021 is when we officially launched. So kind of organically, we've now shifted GI into being what we hope is the playground of 19 media. So we love having colleagues on. We love having uh, friends turn colleagues on, such as the, the wonderful gentleman I'm speaking with now. And while it's wrestling based through our logo, through our, our weekly episodes, I think you can see we talk about family, we talk about uh, film, music, pop culture, basketball, The Bachelor, right? I get my own segment every week to talk about The Bachelor and The Bachelorette, which may not be our most popular segment, but is, <laughs> but is one I recognize that. I, I recognize it's really just to pop myself. A but rose it's, from it's, Tyler. Yes, yes, that's a thing. And shout out to Brad, by the way, for for doing uh, uh, the art, right? Creating the art and and all, doing all the tech of the podcast. We would not run if not for him. So love that man, and he is just immensely, immensely gifted. So yeah, that was the genesis. We just became colleagues who turned into friends. We both love wrestling. And then I got the text message from him on, on starting this. So we really tried to build this from the ground up. It started with a few text messages to each other. And now two, three years later, we have a, a weekly product. We also have built up the website. So we write articles as well on topics ranging from wrestling, again, to family, to basketball, to, to music, we're, we're just really proud of what we've built and are super excited to see 
where we can take it in, in the future. You know, a good thing you mentioned the website because I really was remiss and I really meant to mention the website at the time. I mean, you know, at the very beginning, um, because a lot of people who haven't visited the website, give them the website address. No matter of fact, gimmickinfringementpod.com. Let's go. That's it. There we go. So, like he said, it's so multifaceted. You would probably think, like, yeah, it's just going to be wrestling related. It's just only going to be wrestling. No, it's so multifaceted. Like, we talk about you talk about family. You talk about um, mental health. You're talking about all different aspects. You're talking about music. And personal to me, because, uh, you know, of course, I had to bring this full circle to me. But, <laughs> no, personal to me... Um, Y'all have been so generous with everything that y'all have done and kind of, like I said, um, included me into your your, your, your sphere, your, your axis. Um, this Y'all actually, and it touched me, it touched me at the time and it touches me now. And being the fact that I have you on here face-to-face, I can tell you face-to-face even though we t- told you something in the DMs. Um. For y'all to carve out a spot on your on, on your website for me, like y'all had you know or you know which go you, you of course you're promoting the fe- the fellow GI well the fellow 19 Media Group podcast and then you made a special because I'm not, I'm not part of 19 Media you know which go I mean I love all y'all you know but technically I'm not a part of the group. And for y'all to even just carve out look friends of GI. And you know who's you know who's you know who's which got a, a subject that in, that's in, in, the, the, in the top me. spot. In the in, yeah, in the top spot. That's right. You know, I'm sure I, I am the friend of GI. <laughs> <laughs> you know, just that's to true. Have... That that was that was Brad's creation, by the way. Big shout to Brad. You know, we love you and want to support you any way we can. Brad absolutely made that happen. Definitely, like 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 I've said in the beginning, like. This my new logo, my 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 backdrop for those who are watching on the YouTube. That is a credit to Mr. Winchester, Mr. Brad Winchester, one half of GI. Like uh, we've had discussions of various things, of you know, even some stuff that I I go through, I've gone through personally. And uh, long story short, and this probably I probably should save it for when I finally have him on, but he's a very busy man, so this might have to wait until the summer until he, you know, school season's over. But I kind of told him, I'm like, look, you know, I'm looking to rebrand, um, so to speak. Um, I'm, I'm retiring the alter ego, Donnie Ooh. And if I'm going to retire that and try to rebrand, then I need to start fresh. Like, I need new logo. I just need, I need a, a, a new beginning. And he was like, all right, no problem. Because he's always reached out. I mean, he's always let me know, like, Mike, if you, if you, if you need it, you know, if you need any help or, or which way you have any ideas. Just let me know and I'll help you to the best of my ability, you know. And so one night, I think I just randomly and I reached out like, you know, if it's not too much trouble, if you got time, could you uh, come up with a logo for me? He said, OK. And like randomly, a couple days later, let's say 12 o'clock my time, midnight. And hey Mike, yo, uh, which called uh, you want to brainstorm? Uh, you got any ideas? And, you know, I shoot shot a couple of ideas out. I and this. within a half hour, he's sending me boom. How you like this one? Boom. How you like this one? He's he's nice with it. Uh yeah. You know, a couple of them was 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 kind of like this one. Matter of fact, or one of my episodes, I'll probably use that as the as the art. There's one that was actually technically a joke, but I'm I'm gonna use that as as one as one of my logos. You know, um, it's <laughs> how can I say this discreetly? I mean, shoot, discreet. Like I already dropped a couple f bombs on you, but. I'm literally taking a leak on the Statue of Liberty <laughs> over the, the, the city, the skyline of New York. And that was really supposed to be with the remain within the DMs, but I just said, fuck it. Like that's that that fits me to a T to a certain degree on yeah, time. Yeah, I wanna use I wanna use this one. It's on the nose, literally. You know, so yeah. so like yeah, Brad, Brad is. Brad is Brad is amazing, and um, y'all are amazing. Like y'all have, like I like I said before, y'all have supported me in so many ways, um, both personally and 
professionally if you if we call this podcasting thing profession um i i guess sometimes i try not to use profession because maybe it um lowers the the pressure of me because i always like liken it to a to a hobby um you know because it was like one of those things like i just decided one day i'm like look i have a lot of thoughts that i like to get out to the public to the public at large and um like in my neighborhood i'm kind of known as a sports guy so especially when you know during the summer you know my neighborhood there are always people outside in front of the building want to stoop or what have you and we will always talk about sports and i would go down down the line and and one one neighbor in particular was like yo mike yo you need to go on like a sports jeopardy or something because you have you don't never pick up your phone and have to look thi- like you have things like in cr- almost chronological order in your head about just random facts and random opinions about sports so one day i just said you know what that's right around the time podcasts start well when they exploded i won't say when they started really sprouting because i probably was maybe a couple years behind that curve of when podcasts were really sprouting like my first couple experiences of podcasts were um the stone coast the steve austin podcast wow that was one of the first podcasts that i made a point to listen to and then that kind of branched out into various other wrestling podcasts so i guess this had to be about 2013 um yeah so then i started listening to uh you know uh, uh pro wrestling torch and 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 wrestling observer and so forth and then i remember i remember when chris jericho finally came out with his first podcast because he got the idea off of stone cold and it just started sprouting around yeah. the coca Col- cabana right? uh, yeah coca cabana also like coca cabana to me i'm not gonna lie and not to get too much into it but i would listen to his podcast only based based on the guest like i really wasn't into like the obscure guests like if like he had Dean Ambrose, John Moxley at the time, um, when D- Moxley would not do podcasts for anything, you know. Then of course the infamous CM Punk podcast um, podcast that they had, that the most the most famous bunch. podcast episode in the history of pro wrestling podcasts. Yeah, so that was around the time I started really getting into podcasts. Um, there was one wrestling one in particular. I think I I put Brad on, and when he saw the length of one of the episodes, he was like, <laughs> "What the fuck? <laughs> Three hours?" Uh, Three the hours. name of it. The name was uh, the Lapsed Fan, and what they would do, they would based on what was available on the rest uh, on the WWE Network, they would recap um, various uh, pay per views on on the on the network. But they would do it in their own unique way. It was almost like they was they read the backstory, but then they would explain the backstory in their own unique way to the point it was just hilarious. Sometimes offensive, tell you the truth. A lot of times could be deemed offensive, but it just like they would have six hour podcasts, six hours, and I would listen to it. It would last me a whole shift because especially back go. then, you know, smartphones weren't that smart. You know, you had. You had, you know, you had your, you had your Blackberries, and that was pretty much the smartphone at the time, right? right. You know, so, um, but yeah, the podcasting, it's, it's just, it's something that's, that's, that's grown. Um, I never thought I would be, I think June would be four years since I've been podcasting, wow, which is crazy. That's amazing. You know, um, I never thought that I would really be, uh, very comfortable on video. You know, I mean, I, I've, I've kind of been outgoing to a certain degree, but I never thought I'd be that outgoing on video, and that's and various reasons. But me doing the pot, me doing the YouTube with the Mojo King and our hidden gems football, um, has gotten me very comfortable. <laughs> of course, uh, yeah, see that. Hidden Gen Football, <laughs> hosted by the Mojo King and me, Mike Steph. <laughs> New episodes used to drop on Thursdays, but football season is over. So <laughs> coming 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 back this fall. 
Uh, yeah, I, lo- I, lo- I love I love what you guys are doing there. It's it's so cool to see you two creating something from the ground up. You know, it's 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 a beautiful thing. It really is. Like I've I I really enjoyed doing it. You know, it's kind of it's kind of got me on my A game when it comes to preparation because anybody who knows me or anybody who listened to the um the previous iteration of Salty Thoughts, know I'm a very off the cuff kind of guy. Like off the top of the head, like very spontaneous stream of what Mo, Mo would call a stream of consciousness. Like he was like, Mike, I don't understand. I don't, I don't, I can't fathom how you riff for an hour and a half of just off the top of the head, straight, you know. And you know, it, which God has its, it has its ups and downs, but that was me, you know. But at the same time, I kind of leaned on him or learned on, learned from him of okay, sometimes. Or for my, my case, majority of the time, that's great. But there are some times I really do need to streamline and try to stay on topic. And that's what Hidden Gems Football um, made me do. Or in very various other reasons, but made me kind of just like make sure I had to streamline it. But yeah, here's the, here's the, which go, here's the transition. Since we're talking about GI and you talk about the origins of GI and you did tell, tell me somewhat the origins of GI concerning your wrestling bug. When did you first catch the wrestling bug? Ooh, and I, I also love GI too because it's uh, it's just an outlet, right? Like you do, it's it's art that we're creating. So, um, I think that leads into this question of the wrestling bug. Early, early on, so I was I couldn't have been older than maybe four or five when my dad introduced me to wrestling. So this was right at the peak of the Monday night wars. Okay. I have vivid memories of watching WCW nitro and Monday night raw. And dare I say, I was more of a WCW kid back then, but my dad introduced me. I had the raw is war bed sheets. I had the Goldberg <laughs> t-shirt. Uh, how how dare that man call out Rihanna the way he did? But anyway, back then I had the Goldberg T-shirt. I had all the action figures, ECW, right? Like Sabu, RVD, all these people. Um, so I got to credit my dad for that. Of course, we had the video games, and just we we were so entrenched with wrestling. And and part of why I love GI is that during high school I really fell off from wrestling. It, it there was a real shift of from ages four or five through 13, it was so fun. And I had the occasional friend that was into wrestling or I would introduce them to WWE 2K and then, or at that time, I think it was like SmackDown, here comes the pain. And I would sort of ingratiate them. Like they would, they would uh, see the light and become wrestling fans, at least when they were over our home for sleepovers or, or whatnot. One of my friends, Justin, in elementary school, I started this side business of uh, my dad would tape the pay-per-views okay. and then burn them onto a, a disc, and I would sell them to my peers at the school. Oh, so oh, oh. I was entrepreneur. <laughs> entrepreneur Jones, that's me, okay. Shark Tank City. Uh, so it, it, was, it was a financial investment, I guess, in that, in that regard, too. But when I got to high school, it just became less cool. If you were a wrestling fan, you were kind of an outcast. I, I didn't, I didn't know many other wrestling fans when I was in high school. It was a real shift from early childhood to to those teenage years. And and obviously we know puberty. And when you get to high school, you just have other interests. There's sports. There's, uh, you know, cute girls in your class. And you know, well, they think my CM Punk T-shirt is cool. Maybe, maybe not. So. In high school, I really fell off from it. But then college, I could specifically cite the rise of black and gold NXT getting me back or, or leading to me catching that wrestling bug once again. Okay. So early Sasha Banks, and re- really not even just early Sasha Banks, but the first takeover special they had, it was headlined by Adrian Neville, now the artist known as Pac. Mm-hmm. Against Bo Dallas, huh, yeah. now the artist possibly known as Uncle Howdy. I believe they had a ladder match in the first ever takeover. And I was like, oh, wow, this is cool. This is different. Maybe I should give it another shot. Of course, Daniel Bryan at WrestleMania in New Orleans winning. There were these seminal moments where I thought, oh, wow, I see this going on. Maybe it's time for me to get back into wrestling. And I don't feel that pressure to 
hide my love of wrestling or, or others in high school maybe judging me or not thinking I'm, I'm that cool or that cute because I, I, I love this form of entertainment. By the time I was in college, you know, I'm 20, 19, 20, 21. At this point, I don't have those same social worries that, that I used to. So the wrestling bug was early on. I definitely had an off period from about 09 to 2012. But then not too long after, man, I caught that wrestling bug again. And something I'm grateful for with gimmick infringement is not only can I use some of those journalism skills, if you will, that I learned back in the day that I went to school for, not only can I exercise those now, but also meeting people like you and so many others through GI has been an absolute blessing because wrestling, I've learned, has such a community. It's not just dudes watching in their basement, afraid to talk about it. Um, there are great people like you who, who, who love this that I can connect with and, and, and talk about wrestling with. Also, there's women who watch. I, I didn't know any women during my childhood or, or any peers who were girls that watch this. And I don't blame them because back then, <laughs> women were relegated to mud wrestling matches or bra and panties matches. And when I was 12, did I enjoy that? You, you bet I did. I was not complaining about those being on screen at all. However, I was not a girl. I was not a young woman at that time. I didn't realize how objectifying that was. So I think also me catching that wrestling bug was seeing how the business had grown and, and how women slowly but surely were now being seen as equal counterparts athletically to 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 the to the men on the roster not just objects not just eye candy and uh, that was really a welcome sight for me so caught the wrestling bug early and then fortunately caught it again around i would say 2012 2013 it's funny that you say that um pretty much your break of wrestling happened in high school i wonder how many people have that same journey of you catch it young you do you know you do elementary school you do uh, middle school and then once you get into high school you have different interests you know of course your hormones are raging you you know you're, you're really paying attention to the opposite sex you're, you're you're getting into you know you're getting into sports like basketball football and your time becomes so divided that you don't have the opportunity or you just don't have the time to really delve deep into following week by week especially the time the time period that you got first introduced to it was the Monday Night Raw. You had to, I mean, the Mon yeah, the Monday Night Wars. You had to follow up week by week by week. And the age that you were, you was able to do that. And you said um, your father introduced you to that. So, of course, he's going to make sure that you're available to watch the next yeah, episode. He, he, he's, got, he's got that remote controller. It's, it's up to him what we're watching. Exactly. You know, now, now mine's parallels but you know of course um different time period and actually different reasonings um i caught the wrestling bug i was nine um this was right i think right before first time i really paid attention to wrestling <coughs> excuse me was right right before wrestlemania one i think the first time i really knew what a hulk hogan was was the Saturday Night Live before WrestleMania 1 where him and Mr. T hosted Saturday Night Live. From that point, my mother had a boyfriend at the time and he loved wrestling. And when we moved in with him, we would watch, you know, he would pretty much uh, every Monday on USA, this is when it was, um, oh my God, I, primetime wrestling. It was TNT turned into primetime wrestling. Tuesday Night Titans turned into primetime wrestling. Oh. So we would watch primetime wrestling and they would have all the all like all the matches from the arena shows, especially uh, back then they would be at Madison Square Garden once a month. So at least on one Monday, you would watch all they would have all the all the matches from uh, Madison Square Garden. And then back then, this is like the mid 80s. The arena show, the house show from Madison Square Garden used to play on the Madison Square Garden network on the on their channel. 
So we could you wouldn't watch it live, but you watch it maybe like a day delay or a two day delay. So you'll be. I mean, I remember I watched the snake pit, the snake pit match between Jake the Snake and um and Ricky the Dragon. I remember when I think I sent it to the DMs uh, last week. I don't know. I went through a rabbit hole of when Piper and and Bruno San Martino they had uh, a burgeoning feud, and then a matter of fact, I think that was late eighty five, early eighty six. Piper disappeared. I don't, I don't, I don't remember exactly what happened. I think, you know, in real life, I think he must have went to rehab or something because he was he he just disappeared. Like he had a couple of matches with San Martino. He wasn't on TV. He wasn't at the house shows, and then he reappeared right before WrestleMania two to do the um, do the boxing match with Mister T. Adrian Adonis picked up the feud from. Roddy Piper against Bruno San Martino, and then it culminated in, I believe, a cage match at, at Madison Square Garden with Adrian Adonis, adorable, adorable Adrian Adonis, and the Macho Man versus Bruno and Tito Santana in a cage. Wow! And this is stuff we was able to watch on the <laughs> MSG Network box office. Yeah, yeah, you know. So I say all that to say, all the way up until high school. I was a wrestling head. And then high school kind of coincided with right around the time they had the steroid, steroid scandals. And in New York specifically, we would get so much wrestling because we would get, um, let's say at that time, we would get WCW would come on Saturday morning on Channel 11 WPIX at 11 o'clock in the morning. That evening, about 5, 6 o'clock on, the fo- on Fox 5, we would get superstars of wrestling. Mm. Then on Sunday mornings we would get Wrestling Challenge, which is WWF. So right around the time of steroid cha- uh, steroid scandals, they took all the wrestling off the regular TV. So if you didn't have cable, you could not watch wrestling. Right. I mean, in the eighties we had AWA. Matter of fact, this was our this was our Saturday morning. We had let's say we had superstars of wrestling at ten o'clock. Then we had AWA All Star Wrestling at twelve o'clock. Then at one o'clock we would have um, Gorgeous Ladies of Wrestling, the original, right after AWA. And then fast forward to like six o'clock in the evening, we would have um, superstars again. Well, different superstars of WWF at about six o'clock in the evening. And then late at night they had what they call Wrestling Spotlight, which was like a clip show of arena arena matches from WWF. That was our Saturday. So we went from having four or five different wrestling shows of different um, promotions to none. Wow. Just like that. Yeah, like that. And that coincided with pretty much my, my high school years. Like cool. junior, senior year, there was no wrestling to be found. I couldn't even find a wrestling magazine. It was like it was right, wiped off the map until – the NWO and the outsiders started. And yes. that's actually yes. what got me back into wrestling because they put them back on TV late at night, like on a Saturday night, let's say after midnight. Um, they had uh worldwide wrestling, WCW worldwide, and they would show you clips of Nitro and everything. And that's how I caught up, and that's how it that's how I became engaged with wrestling again. And um, we had some very unfortunate names of the wrestlers that uh, they used to play because the the barbarian. <laughs> there was barbarian and, and and Ming, you know the the the, the faces of fear, and um, throughout <laughs> throughout. <laughs> I know where this is going. <laughs> throughout, which I'm, one, I'm, a, I'm gonna let you. I'm gonna let you cook. I know where this I, is going. Yeah, through our um, you know our, our silliness, for some reason we call the barbarian, the barbasian. <laughs> Why I don't know. I remember this story. And um, we had Dick Slater. For some reason, Dick Slater reared his head, and my best friend called Dick Slater, uh, because they which guy his name was uh Dirty Dick Slater, and uh, my friend would call him Dirty Dick Sweater. <laughs> well, of course, I, I it, it checked <laughs> back then. It it checked out. 
<laughs> you know, but um, but yeah, that 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 was my little short um uh it's called story of catching the wrestling bug we all have we all have a story we all do and i think like you said it's it's common that we all have a specific point in our lives where it it sort of fell off but some of us return to it some of us don't come back but fortunately you and i you and i caught the bug again now the now one of the last things that i wanted which gonna bring up because i know shoot this this has been a great great conversation but i can tell it's getting dark out there so i can imagine how long i've been talking (laughs) Um, this this has been a blast but um personal style oh yeah i almost i almost forgot um because i I was like you know what i got two i got two two questions left but i want to make sure i squeeze this one in let's go personal style meaning um your yeah your personal dressing style like what was your what would you consider your um, influences on your personal dressing style over the years? Wow. First, I have to give a, a major shout out again to my family. When I was young, I have the photo books to prove this. When I was young, my parents made it a point to have me looking presentable whenever we went out. So I have photos of toddler me in a sailor outfit. I have other photos. Fo- I know. I know. Not saying they'll see the light of day, but they exist. I have photos. I can imagine. I have photos. Just I was like a, just a big ball. Uh, just yeah, yeah, very. <laughs> it's a whole thing. I have uh, just photos of you know whether it was a sports jersey like a Rod Woodson from the Steelers, and back then my parents just put me in a lot of different fits. I think like you can appreciate it was whatever coordination was important the color scheme of the outfit and i remember having a rod woodson jersey then a vince carter toronto raptors purple jersey and you know my my fashion didn't necessarily speak to my allegiances sports wise i just sort of rocked whatever was cool but gotta give up to my parents for for instilling that in me early on and then from there when i started to craft my own style and you know ask my mom hey can we buy this or eventually buy my own clothes there were a few different people I can I can point to. When I was a teenager, the movie ATL was incredibly influential for me. So, Lauren London, just speaking of childhood <laughs> crush, speaking, you can see there's a type for me here. Um, but I remember Lauren London, new new in Atlanta, like many of us, was just a huge crush during that time period. Uh, but T.I. in that movie, yeah, yeah. Glad she's doing her thing now again with, with that You People join on Netflix. Um, T.I. was a huge influence for me, specifically T.I. in that movie. He had the the polos, the oversized polos, and the, the jorts. They were a little more fashionable than John Cena's jorts, though. But the jorts T.I. wore, uh, really T.I.'s whole essence in that screen and then off screen, this was the paper trail era T.I., when he was one of the biggest rappers in the game, yeah, he 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 him his style his music really spoke to me. Now, by no means was I living the rubber band man lifestyle <laughs> whatsoever, but live your life with Rihanna, bring him out, swagger like us. This man, I know I'm forgetting so many other of his hits. Whatever you like, he was just one of those rappers where I saw him and I said, okay, this guy isn't just good on the mic. He's a stylish cat who clearly thinks about his outfits. Uh, he was in that movie Takers, yeah, around that time frame as well, where these dudes were like bad guys in suits. Mm-hmm. And I was like, "Wow, well, Ti Ti is speaking to me right now." So during my my teen years, Ti for sure, definitely Terrence J on 106 in Park. I didn't just watch for Roxy; I wanted to see the music videos. I wanted to see what Terrence J was wearing. Ti Terrence J and I know this might be obscure choices, but those are really the two guys who influenced my style the most. Of course, again, President Obama being there and seeing him in suits and, and how he would carry himself was was certainly a factor. But it was really T.I. and Terrence J for me. In high school, I wore Echo. I wore Fat Farm. I wore LRG. Uh, I remember Lil Wayne wearing LRG hoodies. It was like kind of a... a like cloverleaf style joint yeah so so even wayne's fashion which is hard to believe for me to say this now but wayne's fashion was kind of influential to me so i was totally into the hip-hop urban scene i had g-unit i had lugs i had the birdman lugs sneaker i had i had listen man i had all that i had the p miller 
the, the <laughs> oh! Romeo. I had, I, I had a P. Miller jersey. Oh, wow. I had a P. Miller jersey. I had FUBU. I had I had a fat Albert FUBU shirt that my mom got me from Ross. Uh, Allen Iverson, of course, was influential. I had the jersey and, again, didn't have the tattoos, but AI just really embracing his own unique style. I think that spoke to me that, okay, like, again, I don't have to get a full sleeve of a, of a, a tattoo, even though I, I thought about doing that when I was a teenager, but but didn't. Um, I saw how comfortable AI was in his own shoes, <laughs> literally and and yeah, literally. So I had the AI footwear, his MVP season with Reebok. Those were the days, man. I was totally into hip hop, urban, basketball. Uh, I had I had those favorite brands that I mentioned. And then now I really take pride like you in in putting together an outfit. So I own a few pairs of Jordan 1s. Always feels good to get complimented on your sneakers. I've come to really appreciate a good turtleneck as well and, and a good denim jacket. Yeah. And yeah. And <laughs> you can just tell when people think about their outfit, you know, when, when it when it's ironed, when it's color coordinated, like you do such a, a fresh job of that. I, I just I really think about that often, but I trace it back to my parents when I was younger saying, you're not just going to go out and be in sweatpants to go to the store. Like you're going to think about how you present yourself to others and, and not only look like you have your stuff together, but like develop your own swag in that and develop your own style and what makes you, you. So I I definitely think a lot about fashion and those are probably my main influences to, to get me here. Now it's funny. Um, when I was, I went through so many phases um like when one of my and this is this is this is really a quote unquote hidden gem one of my influences when i was in elementary school do you remember the tv show where well, have you watched or do you know of the tv show family ties absolutely okay one of my influences when I was in elementary school was Alex P. Keaton. <laughs> so I'm much you could talk so to talk. Much, so much so that um I I really never liked shoes. I always was a sneaker person. But I think I had one pair of loafers in the house and I made a point to wear the loafers. This was in fourth grade. I wear loafers. I wear um whatever quote unquote khakis at the time you know like slacks at the time and i made a point to have i wanted a briefcase so bad and my mother was like what do you mean you want a briefcase i'm like i want a briefcase but that ma i want a briefcase i wanted to i want to take a briefcase to, to school and uh so it wasn't so much of a briefcase but it was like oh i guess an attache case or whatever you yeah. like the shoulder bag yeah, or whatever of course, of course you know so i would bring that in and I, my fourth grade teacher his name was Mr. Yagoda. And he was at the time, even though I didn't know this terminology, I would look at him like he was a prick because he always had, he always wore uh, uh, slacks, t shirt, tie. Not so much, that's not even what so much where I would say he was a prick. He would make a point in fourth grade, you, can, you were not allowed to write in pencil. You had to write in pen and you were not allowed to print. Everything had to be in cursive. Wow. This is fourth grade. The standards were clear. So when I kind of made that turn of, all right, yeah, I want to be like Alex. I want to be like Alex on, 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 on Family Ties. Then I started kind of dressing similar to my teacher. And then I kind of understood, okay, He's not a he's not a prick. Like I said, that wasn't even in my in my in, in my Rolodex at the time of saying that. But he wasn't such a you know which goes such a strickler. It was like no, we have standards. So all right, if even the standards are here, no, your standards are up here. You do not come down. You do not bring your standards to the mean. No, you're going to stay up here. If you want to if you if you want to be in a quote unquote top fourth grade, then you're going to act like you're in the top class of fourth grade. You're wow. not going to just lower your standards i love so um and i like i said looking back i pre i I came to appreciate that sure so that was that was elementary school that didn't last too long because i think my mom was like 
shoot, you can't be going out playing, playing, you know, playing the recess with 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 the slacks and with the you know with the show uh the, the loafers. Like I don't yeah. got bread like that to be buying you loafers every three weeks because <laughs> you're running through Who the loafers. Does? Who does? You know? yeah. So that was that was elementary school. Um, middle school was what it was. Like you know, it's just like it was what 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 it was what it was. High school. Like this is the early '90s. Now I was never a cross color person. I was never a used or damaged um, person. You know those brands. I never liked those. Like I always liked my clothes, for lack of a better term, clean. I didn't like rips. I didn't like uh, you know loud colors. Like I just I like classics. So then it kind of morphed into I don't want to say junior senior year into the preppy look. So you have, you know, you either have the button yeah. down shirt or you have That's the polo right. shirt the with, with the collar up, yes. you know, uh, yeah. you know, which go, you, you, all right, which go, you have either you have your, your polo boots or, or you know, your, which go, your polo boots with the strap or you have your Timberland shoes. I was going to say Tim's. Yep. Yep. You know, you, throw in Tim's. The, Absolutely. you know, you had your polo chino uh, uh, slacks <laughs> and everything. That was yep. my thing. Right. Yep. And right around that time. We had Grand Nubian, so you had Grand Puba. Grand Puba kind of to me popularized Tommy Hill figure brand because Tommy Hill figure shirts were so unique. They they were colorful, they wasn't overly loud. They were still they were classy to be akin to polo. Everybody knew they wasn't polo because polo's a classic, it never goes out of style. But Tommy Hill figure was still was in that realm. And I used to love how um, Grand Puba would have his Tommy Hill figure, Jack, I mean, which goes shirt, and he would have the backpack, the match, and so forth. So, like, I, I, I used to love that, you know. And, uh, yeah, I know it's gotten dark. It's gotten dark quick. <laughs> but, yeah, so that was that was my thing because back then we had Jan Sports on book bags. So you had, you had to make sure your Jan Sport matched your Columbia, Columbia jacket. Uh, you had to make sure that you had your little, all your strings on your Jansport because, especially in Brooklyn, having a lot of strings kind of made you a victim or put a target on you because everybody wanted to try to rob you for your strings, for your Jansport bag. This is just part of it's just part of part of how old Brooklyn was, you know. Um, and then in my, I guess my, my post teen years, um, I loved plaid. Like plaid was my go to. Like any type of button, uh, dress, you well, not dress shirt, any type of button shirt I had always had to be plaid. I didn't like plain button shirts. If I'm gonna have a button shirt, I wanted some flavor to it. I wanted plaid, of course. But there's one thing, and I and I and I joke, I jokingly say this because I know it wasn't me, but I take credit for it. And being the fact you might have been in that age range because you're two years you're about two years older than how old my oldest son would be which is crazy to think about so i that's how i'm kind of like yeah you're probably in that age range that you know what i'm talking about remember they used to actually make shirts it would be a it would be like a let's say like a a short sleeve shirt and then it would have the sleeve it still would have the sleeve yes before that happened let's say late 90s I don't know why I would always have a short sleeve shirt or let's say a polo shirt and I would have a long sleeve underneath. I would have a short sleeve button shirt and I have a sleeve underneath. I would have a, a long sleeve underneath. So when they actually, I saw, we saw going to gap kids for my kids and, and children's <laughs> place and all that stuff. And I yeah. saw this, I'm like, this is, that was, this is that was my, that was my, my, somebody saw my me. This is, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like I said, I take credit for it. Now, in my older years, um, one of my, one of my, you know, my go-to, my influences, which is crazy. Um, I sometimes used to call myself the Black Doug Heffernan of King of Queens, and I used to love that um, Doug would wear a lot of sports. Sports, uh, sports themed shirts. Like he was a Jets fan. You knew he was a Jets fan. He either had a hat, or he had a Jets sweater, or he had a Jets shirt, or something. And he had a pair of sweatpants. 
and I gained weight. I don't I don't know why. I think I I think this is when I started really loving beer. Cause I never was a real beer drinker, but then there was a, like a period of time I loved me some beer. So I gained some weight. And I used to I had maybe like 10 pairs of sweatpants, all different types of kinds, all different types of um, you know, colors, whatever. My wife hated sweatpants. She hated me with sweatpants. Because you know the whole thing of you know which going like some women like men in sweatpants because you can kind of and especially your significant other doesn't want anybody to see what they have at home. So <laughs> my wife didn't particularly like having sweatpants. Me having sweatpants on, but my thing was I was oblivious Understood. to that. Uh, yeah, I was oblivious to that. Like, look, this is this is my stage, or whatever. And um, then 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 it just kind of morphed into. Um, T-shirts, like I'm a T-shirt, I'm a T-shirt slash hoodie fiend. Like I can, that's that. You know how Amelda Marcos was famous for all her thousands and thousands of sh of shoes back in the day. Um, the, which was the the first lady of the Philippines, I believe, or was it the okay. Philippines? Yeah, I think Philippines back in the days in the '80s. I am that way when it comes to T-shirts and hoodies, but especially wrestling T-shirts. Yes. I got I a love, few of those. Yeah, I love a wrestling t-shirt. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, um, even though the quality has, the quality of the shirt has gotten better over time, but sometimes to me, to a certain degree, the designs have gotten worse. Definitely. It's like they've gotten lazy, but yeah. it's great to have a t-shirt that doesn't feel like cardboard anymore. Right. Because some of the WWE t-shirts, they were, oh, you couldn't they really wear those in the summertime. Yeah, they were they so were rough. rough. Yeah. You know, I had my um, Eddie and, Guerrero tee back in the day. Yeah, and 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 like I said, I I love a I love a hoodie, I love a hoodie, um, and what my what my thing is now is, especially with the with the era of everybody has a YouTube show, everybody has a podcast or whatever, everybody's on social media, and everybody's trying to serve merch. And if my thing is, if I like, if I indulge and listen to your podcast, and you put out some dope merch, guess what? I'm gonna buy that shit. So <laughs> you know, to me, it's like a badge of honor. Like, yo, all right. Like, like I think we were discussing before. Like I, I got my GI shirt. All right, fine. That's Stamp. So cool. yes. You know, um, yes. there's a guy on Twitter, um, which guy that that's a uh, like part of war. Uh, I think it, he goes under the moniker Warriors World, and he always comes out with um with specific uh Golden State Warriors merch, i.e. Steph Curry merch. You know, and I make a point. Like he came out with a hoodie last year for Steph Curry breaking the three point record. Best believe. Soon as Ready I saw go. it was available, Car add, it. add the cart. Yes. Uh, yeah, you know, he got a he got he got another one. Um he has this thing called Steph Steph Better. So everything every every year he comes out with Steph Better merchandise. So this year it was Steph Better 23. That's the campaign. And of course, since my I'm Mike Steph, I'm like, oh, this is perfect. Steph better. It goes both ways. Like, all right, with Steph, Steph Curry, and, and myself. Yeah, I'm better than the majority of my efforts. You know, so that that's always been my thing. So, um, so yeah, that's my personal style, especially, you know, like I said, I'm, it's it's crazy to say this, but I'm pushing fifty, but um, yeah, yeah, I'll be forty seven. So, um, unbelievable. I just feel like at this age, we have a freedom to pretty much do whatever the hell we want to do. Um, you know, of course, I could I could clean up with the best of them, like, shh, don't 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 get it twisted, or because y'all, a lot of people see me in a hat and a t shirt. When it comes to when it comes to like you know be suited and booted, yeah, I I I I I could pull that off too, you know. Yeah, absolutely. Well, and and even I have so much nostalgia for the '90s, particularly because of the the fashion and pop culture scene. I, I failed to mention this. My favorite show of all time is The Fresh Prince of Bel Air. So seeing what Will wore back in the day, huge influence. He he kind of mixed the you know, the funky colors with the sports memorabilia. So you could have a Sixer jersey. You could have a Grambling State shirt, they get the hat. I think that was also subliminally, I started to realize, oh, I kind of like these neon colors and I like what Will's doing. And obviously jazz is is always looking great. Yeah. So I'm, I'm, I'm right there with you. Mixing in the, the sports, the tees, the hoodies, the caps, of course, with, uh, you know, when you need to show up for a job interview or some sort or a wedding or any formal occasion, you know that you can switch up and, and rock that look, too. That was beautiful. 
it was it was a beautiful time and i and i and i just like it. that that keeps me grounded it keeps me it just gives me some time some like i said and i'm a sneakerhead not a sneakerhead to the sneaker collectors out there because like that's that's, I can't, that's really I can't not my that. thing you know like i like I, i'll be i admit like look I, yeah i got you know i i, I got a pair of, I got a pair of jordans and everything um i think the last pair i bought was like uh uh what was it what was the call of it it was the was it the true blue fives or something that or the they, they were black black fives um with the with like the the, the blue and and it, it it was black like black i think it was black suede and they had like the blue accents on it Ooh. um i, I forgot I i've seen those i forgot the name the actual name of them but um it wasn't electric blue but um regardless the reason i even got those is because my son he he was a jordan head like I think it was more like when he was younger, you know, sometimes he wasn't behaving as as well as he was supposed to. So he wouldn't get be able to get all the Jordans that he would want. So once he got older, he's like, he would just cop them. Relatable. Then, Relatable. Yeah. You know, and Come then up. when he had kids, then he would make, he, of course, all right, I'm going to get a pair. I'm going to get my kids a pair. We're going to match. Now, once he passed, I'm like, all right, well, that doesn't mean that tradition has to stop. You know, so certain things, Certain Jordans that would come out, I would look. I'm like, I know for a fact that he would he would get these. So I made a point. All right, got 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 my two grandkids, got them a pair, and I'm like, I'm gonna get them a pair. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Least you could do is yeah. You know, I don't, I don't blame you at all. Uh, yeah, you keeping know, the tradition, so, keeping the tradition going. But like right now, I I love I I fallen in love with New Balance. Ooh. They've, like, they've, listen. They've come a long way. Yeah, like I, I'm, I'm, I'm a, I'm a classic. So I felt, I fell back in love with the five seventy fours, the classic five seventy fours, and like to my wife's detriment, well, to my wife's chagrin, like for the last couple of weeks, all of a sudden we'll get a box. She's like, "Babe, what's those?" I'm like, <laughs> "Those are <laughs> sneakers. Those are, those, are, those are my New Balances. You don't need no sneakers." And she'll pull them out. She's like. Oh, oh, oh! So now, now, since 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 when you started watch um like in Blue Balance, like she she gets oh I forgot, to, but she started buying New Balance, and I used to like the way they looked on her, but I didn't like particularly the ones that she got because, like I said, I'm an old head, so I always think about the five seventy four. Like I always like those; they're nice and comfortable. You can get them in get them in extra width, so they're not squeezing your foot. And I got bunions anyway, so <laughs> I got all that. You know, so it was it was. I, I just I just love um New Balance. Like I I'm also a Air Max head. Like I buy a lot of Air Max because I got flat feet. So they told me I gotta start wearing run the sneakers. So I was like, all right, F it. I can't, you know, so I buy the Air the Air Max. Um, but last but not least, because I know we gotta wrap this up soon. Um, very soon, tell you the truth. Um, I'd be remiss if I don't bring this up. Before we get out of here, especially being the fact that I listened to you and fellow 19 media group member from Hip to the Games talk about two hours or so on your on your memories or your thoughts on Drake, Aubrey Graham. Favorite genre of a genre of music. Um what would what would your favorite genre of music be? I am and thank you for listening to that. Shout out to Dez. I had such a good time with him. I'm an R and B lover at, at my core. It, it's gotta be R and B one. Hip hop is definitely a close two. Don't get it twisted. I also love I also love salsa and merengue. Um I can get down with some pop music as well. My dad is a huge country fan. I can't say I've inherited that gene. But uh, on the right occasion, the right artist, I can, I can, I can mess with it. R and B is number one, though. So I love in terms of my favorite R and B artists, current and 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 from yesteryear, Sade, Kehlani, gosh, SWV, hmm. Usher. I mean, the Ashanti. The list just goes on and on. I love me some R and B. Hip hop is right behind, though. Whether we're talking Drake, of course, most influential artist of of my life, Kendrick, Cole, Rhapsody, um, there there are so many artists out there. D- dare I say, Donnie Ooh, 
as as well. I got I got the mixtape. There are <laughs> so many artists out there. Frank Ocean. I mean, I could just you know list off maybe who, who's on my playlist these days. I do enjoy Logic as well. I know he's kind of a, a controversial figure, but I think his first two albums were were pretty incredible. So R and B's number one for me. Hip hop a close second, and I try to stay open to to all genres. One of my favorite parts of my life is when uh, a friend sends me music to listen to, whether that be a song or an album. I love learning about the artists that that others are listening to. So I really think music makes the world go around. Definitely. And I, I am I try to keep an open mind to a little bit of everything. But that being said, I want to know who you're listening to these days. Um, and your favorite genre as well. I think I'm pretty sure I know what the favorite genre is, but uh, confirm that for me. And then who's who's on the playlist? It's you know what's so funny? Like when I was growing up, um, I'm going to try to keep this as short. But when I was growing up, and I think uh, me, especially me and Brad had this conversation, there was so many different genres that kind of just mixed. It wasn't so rigid of, um, all right, you got to listen to R&B, or you got to listen to rock, or you got to listen to pop, you got to listen to um, the beginnings of hip hop. It was just like everything. Like, like when I was in, when I was growing up, I used to like, I used to love Duran Duran. Oh, nice. You know, like, nice. um, I don't know which called Phil Collins. Um, Phil Collins, Prince, I hope Prince is up there. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. Stevie Prince, Wonder, I failed Stevie to mention. Wonder, yes. uh, of course, Mike, Michael goats. Jackson. Um, shoot, Sade, Holland, Holland um, Oates. Ho oh, I think Holland Oates is in my think, current playlist right now. I, I think we've said each other Holland Oates before. Hall, love Holland Oates, you know, so. Currently, I don't really listen to anything current. I listen to the oldies, so to speak, like late seventies, early to mid eighties R and B. Um, gold, gold Cheryl gold. Lynn, um, Evelyn Champagne King, yes. um, The Time, Morris cook. Day was a monster. I'm gonna let you cook. You know, like that's what's really shoot. This is another one, which is which is Michael McDonald. Yes, the Doobie ain't no, Brothers and ain't, ain't no Mountain High. I, Come on, now. talk about it. Like this, this is what is in my playlist right now. Like, um, there's there's, there's actually a, a group. I'm I'm not sure you you should be familiar with it. It's funny because you always talk about what you know about this young buck. I'm like young buck. <laughs> <laughs> See, that's a shoot. I I love I love that exchange of music with people. It's just it's it's special. So I do send you those captions. Absolutely. You know, so like this is um, <laughs> this is one. I, I, I said, you Tina Marie, what you know about this? Oh I mean, man, I listen, square listen. biz. Um, you which card? I like right now. I'm looking at my. I'm looking at my playlist. I got Sister Sledge, of course. Yes. Um, I have Ambrosia. Mm. I have Rick James, mm. Shalimar, who ah, we've talked about before. Come on now, yes. Um, Give it to us. Luther Vandross, Earth, Wind, and Fire. Teddy P. Oh yeah, of course, Teddy P. Um, you got Tina yeah. Marie. You got, even though they're kind of a one-hit wonder to a certain degree, new shoes. I can't wait. Do, 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 mm. do, do. You know, like yes. Um, you know which one of my favorite songs, and I remember it from back then, and I've listened to it recently. Where well, I start listening to it recently, and when I say this, I try to listen to this at least once a week. Saturday Love by Sherelle and Alexander O'Neill. Yes. Monday, yes. Tuesday, Wednesday. I'm like, it's the, well, here, here's here's the thing. I think you're hitting on a really important point that I don't I don't mean for us to sound like two old heads, but as I enter this next chapter of my life, I've really believed that music as a whole, quality wise, how how it hits you, how it hits you here. It's not the same as it used to be. So you can turn on the radio and and I have, like I said, I have my favorite contemporary artists who I think are outstanding. But watch this transition. The Gap Band. All the art outstanding, all the, yes. All, all, <laughs> geez, I, I told you this is the yeah, salty thoughts. This is the salty thoughts of Mike Stepp. If you don't come correct, don't come correct at all. Don't come at all. You gotta come correct. Preach. Even though I even though I love that. Uh, the 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 music, well. Let me let me try to shift my mindset this year and stay positive. 
the music of previous decades is so special. It just the I know you can relate to this. The joy it brings you when you hear it. You want to start dancing. You want to you want to send the song to someone because it makes you so happy. I don't know that that exists as much anymore. The all the artists you mentioned from the seventies, the eighties, the nineties. I really yearn for that time period back. I don't think the quality is is quite there. And we know hip hop wise, I'm sure there are artists who I'm not hip to, for lack of a better term, that I need to be. But by and large, you know, the I, I know students who will mention current artists that are relevant. And I'm so lost, Mike. I don't know NBA Young Boy. I don't know Polo G. I don't know Lil Baby that well. <laughs> and maybe, maybe some of these people are legit ice spice. I, I don't <laughs> people, people will bring up these names and maybe it's cause I'm not on TikTok, but people will bring up these names and I'm like, yo, I'm still listening to Kendrick. Good kid, mad city. I'm still on Jay Z four forty four. Uh, I'm still listening to Kehlani. It was good until it wasn't like, I just kind of cling to the albums. I know I love yeah. without branching out to what the new generation is, is consuming. What I, what I try to do, I try, well, what's, what's been happening is like, with, especially with my, my youngest K, um, and, out, and okay. actually Hi, my daughter, Mia, thank you. Yeah, Mia. Um, yeah, when we're on the car, when we're in the car, I try to let them listen to, if, they, if they're not listening to their own stuff in their, on their phones, I try to listen, I try to give them the radio. Cause like, I know they don't really want to listen to the music that I like listening to, especially if it's if it's a sh- if it's a short trip. If it's a long trip, I- I'm sorry, this is what we're rocking with. But if it's a short <laughs> trip, all right, I'll let you I'll let you rock the radio. And what I'll do is I'll even ask them, like we hit listen to Hot 97 to Power 105 up in New York, and I'll listen to something like, and I'll ask them, who's that? So like this is one song, and it's been my go to right now for 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 explaining this. It's one song. I don't know the name of it, but it has. Cardi B and Glorilla. And I'm like, fuck is Glorilla? So they would tell me, yeah. Da, 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 da. And I'm listening to it. Now I'm listening to it. I'm not going to lie. I'm listening to it. It took me a while, and especially now since I've kind of weaned myself back into not writing and not making songs that much. I always have a problem because I would listen to it with a with a writer's ear. I wouldn't, I couldn't listen to music to just enjoy it. As soon as I listen to it, I'm hearing the beat. And the first thing in my mind is, all right. I'm trying to write a bar to it, or oh yeah, I could, I could, I could, I could, I could freak this beat better than da 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 da. So, so now I'm able back, able to just like listen to it for what it is, but still certain things are glaring, and I'm like, so what made me um, come up with that was I asked, I'm like, who's this? So she told me, and I'm like, yo, homegirl or beat? And she was like, huh? I'm like, no, not Cardi. Cardi eating her alive because Cardi's on beat. It's not even so much her lyrics. It's like she's she's catching the beat. She's catching the beat. Homegirl, with Lorilla's she, not, not. Yeah, I'm not listening there. to the li- lyrics and I'm like, okay, she, she got something, but it's off beat. So right then and there, I'm I'm dismissing it. It's like, eh, yeah, you might be spitting, but you're off beat. Like if 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 you're to that level that you got your stuff on having airplay, to me is the least thing you do is could be on beat. But maybe that's the way this generation or this generation of of spitters are coming out like all right it's what you say not it doesn't have to be on beat it doesn't have to ride the beat and i'm like to me both can, both things should be true you should be on beat and still spit your shit you know but um i also have come to the conclusion um that i can't be so dismissive of what's out here right now because in reality at least 90% of the music that you hear on radio is not targeted to somebody in my age range. It's targeted to my children. It's, it's you know, it's targeted to my daughters, it's targeted, targeted to my son. It's that, let's say that, that 16 to 25 demographic. Yeah. I'm not, I'm not in that demo anymore. You know, so I'll, I'll, I'll pass that down. Yeah. So I have, I have come to that realization of, I might not be able to, I might not be feeling it, but guess what? It's not meant for me to feel. It's meant for them to feel. And it's probably the same thing of when I when I loved my Big Daddy Kane and, and KRS-One and so Rock forth. Him. 
uh, Rock, exactly, Rock right. him and and nice and smooth back in the day. Right. My mom used to be like, cut that, cut that noise down. Not cut the music down, cut that noise, noise. down. Yep, yep. So it's just it's it's relative. It's the same thing. So I I, I give this younger generation the grace of all right. If that's what floats your boat, if that's what y'all rock with, I can't get mad at it. It's, it's not for me to get mad at. It. I can't dismiss it. If it's not, if it's not me, it's not me. Exactly, because you know? that—that's what the previous generation, like you said so astutely, was saying about the artists we we enjoy. So that, yeah, that's. I think we're on the same wavelength. That that's why I, I try to reframe my my perspective to. It's not. Let me just bash on the new generation and their lack of taste. Um, it's no, let me speak about my love for, for the music of my era and previously, especially previously to my era coming up. And, uh, you know, just, I love that. And if the kids are now feeling Glorilla, Cardi, the people I mentioned who I don't remember their names now, if they're feeling them that, like you said, that's great. Let's not, let's not speak ill of them. Let's say, Hey, this is your generation. You're enjoying it. It's marketed toward you. That, that's good with me, but also, can we slide in some Hall and Oats or some? But you know, I will so say this: I will say this last in. thing when it comes to when it comes to music. Um, one thing that they really do need to do because the attention span is so short that it's very easy to dismiss songs, and that's probably why they don't have the lo- you know which got uh, the the, the, the long lasting, uh, uh, you know, effect on on people. But it's the fact of everything sounds the same. Yeah, it's true. Everybody has the same type of beat. Everybody has the same quote unquote drill beat. Everybody has the same quote unquote drill flow. And it's very hard to kind of differentiate between all right, this person spitting some real shit and this person spitting basic because everything to the common ear sounds the same. And it's right. easy. It's very disposable. Is what right. I used to term microwave music. Right. I, I I may have to borrow that. That's that's true. And TikTok is not only the world's most influential app, but it is also having a huge effect on music and the consumption of music, particularly for the younger generation. You said that sixty to twenty five demo, who I think are a large portion of TikTok's consumers. Yeah. My understanding, again, speaking as someone who who doesn't have a TikTok, so take this with a grain of salt. My understanding is that a lot of artists are becoming famous because of the music they're creating on TikTok. So it's if I can create something catchy that's going to stick in their mind as they're scrolling, oh, then my song may blow up on the iTunes chart, on the Spotify playlist, etc. So I think also TikTok is sort of influencing can I get a catchy beat? Can I get a catchy hook? And if so, maybe that'll lead to dollar sales. That'll lead to attention. That'll lead to plays. And, you know, it doesn't necessarily matter what my content is, but is it catchy? Is that beat flames? And if so, I'm going to get the bag. Yeah. You know, it, 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 that, that, that's very astute for you to say, because that's it's similar to how it was in the early 2000s with the ringtones. Yes. I, I had I, I had fabulous breathe as one of my first ringtones. Do you uh, yeah, remember like, that? Yeah, because like that's a lot of that people, a lot of artists would make songs for it to pop off the yeah. ringtone. Yep. Hence the hence the, the, the term ringtone rappers. Yeah. You know, so it's the same, it's the same difference when it comes to what you said about TikTok. A lot of people are getting um famous off the TikTok because all you have to do is have that that which guard that 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 hit that that is There's it? something that just clicks in your head, yeah. and then especially the, if you speed the, it up. I, yeah, the Island Boys, right? I don't know if you heard about those two cats, but... Nope. <laughs> yeah, the Island Boys. You can look this up. It's a little... Yeah, I'm sure you have better things to do with your time, but uh, the Island... I think that's their name. The Island Boys got famous on TikTok and then, you know, accrued some level of fame and, and I'm sure money from that. But you're so right. Even speaking about ringtones, Mike, you remember all of us had a ringtone back in the day. Now it just seems like such a foreign, uh, old concept of a ringtone. It's just, I, I guess we're dinosaurs. I don't know. I remember a ringtone. I had several ringtones, including "Fabulous Breathe." That was a that, that was a golden era for sure. I'll say this last thing when it comes to ringtones. I had a ringtone. I'm not going to say who was who was um 
aimed at. But I had a ringtone um, of uh, Halloween, Michael Myers. <laughs> Needless to say, when they when my when my phone would go off at work, people a couple of people called on without even knowing. They were like, "Oh, getting a getting a call from home, huh?" <laughs> <laughs> You personalized it. Okay. I think I think I just have one general. I love that you uh you specifically slotted it for, for who the caller was. That, uh, yeah, that, that's I, that's a that's a level of commitment that I was not operating on back then. <laughs> just fabulous for everybody. Man, it's it's been it's been such a pleasure. Like I really appreciate you um coming on being my first shoot my first guest ever no matter of fact i can't say first guest ever but my first guest yeah my first guest ever on the salty thoughts of mike steph yeah that's right the salty thoughts of mike steph and giving me so much content that this is probably going to be a double episode <laughs> you know i was wondering that once we once we passed the two hour mark i was thinking in my head as i was listening to you on mike I think I might get the two part treatment. Which oh yes, is a, which is a huge honor. Oh yes, shoot, he's going to be here. This part one and part two will be featuring the one and only Tyler J McDowell from the Gimmick Infringement Podcast. Um, but yeah, I, like I like, truthfully, I really, I really appreciate you uh, carving out time in your schedule, your very busy schedule, um, to uh, to just chop it up with me. Um, we wish going. I, I'm not gonna lie, I was looking at these subjects. I'm like, I'm getting all these subjects in. <laughs> if he tells me, all right, we got to take a time, all right, uh, it is what it is, but I'm gonna get these subjects in. <laughs> but, you know, um, I respect no. it. but, um, but yeah, I like, I really appreciate it. Um, because we it, the, in the lead up, you know, I, I told you, I was like, yeah, you know, I'm not gonna lie, I'm a little, I'm a little nervous. And which going, I was like, yo, but the, the, the main part is just for us to have fun. Um, for it to be fun and shoot, it surpassed even those expectations. Like I had a blast. I, I really appreciate you, brother. Oh, likewise, brother. Well, thank you so much again. I am so excited to see what you do with your new platform. I know it's going to be fantastic. You know, we're going to be there to support you every step of the way. Of course, I'm going to just brush my shoulder off a little bit that I was. I am the first guest uh, in, in this new era. Uh, no, man, so grateful for you and your time and all the love that you've shown us over at Gimmick Infringement. It has meant the world. It means the world. And I just had an absolute uh, amazing time with you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, do you have any any which one, any plugs you want to get out uh, into the into the world, to the masses? Um, where to find you on various social media platforms and where to find Gimmick Infringement, the podcast? The YouTube show, the just the flagship of 19 Media, uh, the floor is yours. Oh, you know I do. Well, I'll start with the team first. So we are at GIPod19 on Twitter. As you mentioned earlier, gimmickinfringementpod.com is the website where you can find all of our podcast episodes, the articles we write, uh, everything and anything you could want is, is on the website. Uh, definitely encourage you to follow on Twitter. Like I said, we are also on Facebook and Instagram. If you just search Gimmick Infringement Pod, you can find me at Tyler J. McDowell on Twitter. I am on Instagram and Facebook. And, and yeah, yeah, I just, I love the video you have going on here. I'm on Twitter there. Uh, I'm on the other social platforms, LinkedIn, on the professional side, all, all that. So you can find me there. And uh, I would love to, to connect with you and uh, definitely think Jim. GI. I don't know if I want to say GI or gimmick infringement. I definitely think GI, which stands for gimmick infringement, is worth your time. Again, pro wrestling and much, much more. We'd love to, to have you uh, check us out. Yes, gimmick infringement drops every Monday. Matter of fact, I don't even want to make it more specific than that. Every late Sunday night, early Monday morning on the YouTube page of the 19 Media Group. He knows for a fact, because I'm 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 a quasi night owl. I don't go to sleep until about three o'clock in the morning. So a lot of times they drop Eastern time, two a.m. on the YouTube streets. And best believe, I press play. I'm probably like the first or second view. I press play as soon as I get that notification. <laughs> I'm watching it. I put my little comments up. Sometimes I fall asleep and I wake up and I'm like, oh, where did I, I know exactly where I left off at. 
and I finish it the next morning. So, you are you are so good to us. Everything you just heard Mike say is absolute truth. Uh, you know, we'll post in the morning, obviously, but sometimes I'll wake up to you messaging us what you thought about the episode. I'm like, oh man, he my, Mike is a real one because we haven't even posted this to any of the socials. We're hours away from posting, but he already checked it out and already supported us. So thank you so much for, for not only supporting, but for mentioning that. Uh, yes, every Monday we drop a new episode. Sometimes we have specials that drop uh, before or after then we have a few specials recently on the article side on, on the on the actual podcast side but you can definitely count on us every single monday and again we'd love to to have your support thank you for that mike yeah yeah no not a problem not a problem it, like i said it's been a pleasure like like y'all y'all i've said this before i've said it again i said it again and i'm going to say it for the last time on this episode y'all have ingratiated me into the fold so much and like from day one and um, it was, it's funny because the first time I was on on their platform, just like I said, the lead up to WrestleMania last year, and I was so reserved for what I normally would do because I was like, this is the first time they're really getting to talk to me. So I don't want to burn no bridges and go and go way overboard. You know, so it was it was like I, I had the microphone. I didn't have my my trusty little uh, uh, what Yeti or whatever the heck. So I was like this. And and I and I, I remember was, I, that. Yeah, and they're like, I know they probably was like, what's the matter? And then on top of it, then it got late. So pretty much, you saw how he got up and turned the light on. Guess what? I didn't have a chance to do that because I felt so awkward. Like, no, I don't want to get up and change, <laughs> turn the light on. So I'm just gonna have this this uh this, this computer light. <laughs> and then we fast forward to uh, a couple months ago for the for the Survivor Series recap. And by this time, they pretty much knew me. Um, yeah, they knew me and they knew Donnie. So it was like, yeah, pretty much I could kind of let let loose. But um, but either way, they like I said, they they really showed me support so much. So I I, I just love the fact that I was able to actually have them come on over. <laughs> <laughs> no, you 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 know the love is mutual. Uh, this certainly won't be the last time that we record on air. At least I hope. So, uh, yeah, man, we, we love you. We love what you do. And I, uh, I'm just so excited to see where, where you take the salty thoughts of Mike Steph from here. This is your year, my man. And I'm, that's, that's, the, that's the plan. That's the plan. And I, I'm trying to uh, see that plan through fruition. So with all that being said, um, I will see you all next week. Oh, before I forget, I'm going to – I got actually, I need to announce this. I should have announced it at the beginning, but whatever. The Salty Door to Mike Steph will be a two-platform podcast. So, yes, I'm going to still be in audio form, and y'all will get everything that y'all used to in audio form. You know, the usual, well, the format of the little intro, the little outro, maybe a little tune here and there for what I can get away with. But I will be a consistent presence on the YouTube. YouTube of Mike Steph. Yeah, that's the name of the YouTube page, Mike Steph. And yes, we will be dropping concurrently. So a lot of times you'll probably get the audio on that Monday and you'll get the visual no later than that Tuesday. So yeah, this is going to be a two-platform podcast. Let's go. On. Breaking no, no, news. Yeah, there's, there's not going to be no splitting up. Let's it's, go. This is, the, how, this is how we're going to do it. Because sure, I got all this. I got all these graphics here. I got to make use of this. Y'all can't see this on, 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 on what's going on Anchor. Y'all can't see this on Apple Podcasts. Y'all can't see this on Spotify. Y'all can't even see this on Amazon Music. Oh, yeah. Y'all didn't know I was on Amazon Music. Yeah, I am. So. <laughs> got it like that. Yes, sir. This man? Uh, got, yes, sir. He's, he's got it like that. So with all that being said, um, thank you for listening to this debut episode. And um, one thing that will not change is I will see y'all next week. Goodbye. <laughs>